Thank you, Larry, and good morning, everybody. Good to see each of you here today. We welcome you. And if you happen to be a visitor with us, we're happy to have you. And would you please fill out one of the community cards in the pew rack in front of you? And uh, you could place it in the plate as you're leaving the church just outside the doors there. Um, so you have some important ministry opportunities to uh, mention this morning. Things coming up soon here. Um, Easter season is not too far away. And we're, we have some big plans, I think, that you will be very interested in. Um, <clears throat> first of all, on Sunday, March 28th, we'll be celebrating the triumphal entry on Palm Sunday. Then on April the 1st, we will reflect, reflect on the cross on a special Monday, Thursday service. And that's a little different for our, for our church to call it that and so on. But that's when we, we'll have a communion service and a praise and prayer time together. So that's something to look forward to. Um, so that's going to be at 6 p.m. And then on April the 4th, we will all gather together to celebrate the resurrection of Christ to, um, in a very special Easter service. You won't want to miss that, and you want to think about who you could invite uh, to that service. Be praying about that. Um, and uh, so these are some special things coming up in just the next few weeks that we look forward to. Well, let's begin our service with a word of prayer, shall we? Heavenly Father, thank you so much for this new day, the Lord's Day, when we can meet together with others of like precious faith to sing your praises uh, to worship you, to learn more about you, and to open your word together. We look forward to what you're going to do this hour. Bless each one that um, helps us lead the service, and as pastor brings the message, we look forward to that and all that you're going to do this hour. So we commit it to you and ask for your blessing and guidance. In Jesus' name, amen. Here we go. <laughs> I didn't put a note to turn the power on, but I turned the note on. To, I put the note to unmute it. So next week, I will. Uh, I'll, I'll have it all taken care of. All right. Well, good morning. Thanks again, Tom. I'd like to invite everyone to stand for the reading of the word, the call to worship, the word of the Lord in uh, John chapter one, verses eleven through thirteen, says he came to his own. And his own did not receive him, but to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. Let us join together in singing to the Lord this morning. Oh! 
Let's continue our worship as we go to the Lord in prayer. Would you please pray with me? Our gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for another day. A day wherein we can come and we can join our hearts and our voices together to sing your praise because you are our God. And Lord, we praise you for all that you are to us. You are our creator. You are our sustainer, our redeemer and friend. But we thank you for what you've done. We thank you for sending your son, Jesus Christ, who died in our place, taking upon himself the full payment of all of our sin and shame. So Lord, thank you. We praise you. We lift your name up this morning. And Lord, we thank you for this time that we can gather, gather together and to encourage each other and to hear your truth. Lord, knowing full well that there's no one here by accident, but by your sovereign hand, you've called us together for your purposes. And so, Lord, as we gather together, we're mindful of the fact that we live in a fallen world. There's trouble all over our land, all over the world, in our country, even in our own neck of the woods, in our own communities. We have heartbreak, tragedy. And Lord, we need your healing hand upon us. And Lord, as we gather, we recognize there are those here who are hurting, who have heartache, going through difficulties in their relationships, difficulties overcoming sin and rebellion, financial concerns, health issues. Lord, you know it all full well. And Lord, we thank you that we can come to you and we can lay our burdens at your feet and you hear us as we cry out to you. And we ask for your healing hand. We ask for your restoration, for your care. Oh God, we need you so desperately. So Lord, thank you. Thank you for the high privilege we have to gather together in your name and to be with you knowing that as we gather, you are here in our midst and we're not alone. So Lord, thank you. Thank you for all that you are to us. We pray all this in your son's wonderful and awesome name. Amen. Well, the children are dismissed to Children's Church if they haven't left already. It sounds like they already left. We missed it or I missed it. So we have a special opportunity this, this morning in the life of our church. I'd like to invite Kent and YY to come forward. And as they come, uh, we're introducing them to you as new members. They've gone through the process here at Oakwood. Uh, and they've been interviewed by elders to hear their testimony of you know, profession of faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And so with that, we have some certificates for you. Here's one for you, YY. Congratulations on that. And here's one for you, Kent. And we also have some parting gifts for you today. We have lifesavers, all right? Again, we're in the business of saving lives here, making disciples who make disciples, right? That's what we're called to do. And uh, I'm just so thankful for you that you want to partner with, with us to do that. So here you go. You can share that with all the kids. I'm sure they'll love it. Let's thank the Lord for these two, shall we? Thank you. All right, please take your Bibles and let's turn to the book of Acts as we continue our study. We're in chapter 3 today, Acts chapter 3. We'll be starting in verse 1, and we have a lengthy uh, chapter here. We're going to do what we can to get through all of chapter 3, and uh, we'll see uh, how that goes. But let's uh, look at the text first of all. Let's read the word. Starting in verse 1, here we have our author, Luke, who's given this to us, and this is what he writes as the early church continues to grow and expand. In verse 1, we read, now Peter and John were going up to the temple at the hour of prayer, the ninth hour, and a man lame from birth was being carried, whom they laid daily at the gate of the temple, that is called the beautiful gate, to ask alms of those entering the temple. 
Seeing Peter and John about to go into the temple, he asked to receive alms. And Peter directed his gaze at him, as did John, and said, look at us. And he fixed his attention on them, expecting to receive something from them. But Peter said, I have no silver and gold, but what I do have, I give to you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. And he took him by the right hand and raised him up. And immediately his feet and ankles were made strong. And leaping up, he stood and began to walk and entered the temple with them, walking and leaping and praising God. And all the people saw him walking and praising God and, and recognized him as the one who sat at the beautiful gate of the temple, asking for alms. And they were filled with wonder and amazement at what had happened to him. And while he clung to Peter and John, all the people utterly astounded, ran together to them in the portico called Solomon's. And when Peter saw it, he addressed the people, men of Israel, why do you wonder at this? Or why do you stare at us as though by our own power or piety we have made him walk? The God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob, the God of our fathers, glorified his servant Jesus whom you delivered over and denied in the presence of Pilate when he had decided to release him. But you denied the holy and righteous one and asked for a murder to be granted to you. And you killed the author of life whom God raised from the dead. To this we are witnesses. And his name, by faith in his name, has made this man strong whom you see and know. And the faith that is through Jesus, has given the man this perfect health in the presence of you all. And now, brothers, I know that you acted in ignorance, as did also your rulers, but what God foretold by the mouth of all the prophets, that his Christ would suffer, he thus fulfilled. Repent, therefore, and turn back, that your sins may be blotted out, that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord, and that he may send the Christ appointed for you, Jesus, whom heaven must receive until the time for restoring all the things about which God spoke by the mouth of his holy prophets long ago. Moses said, the Lord God will raise up for you a prophet like me from your brothers, you shall listen to him in whatever he tells you, and that shall be done, that every soul who does not listen to that prophet shall be destroyed from the people. And all the prophets who have spoken from Samuel and those who came after him also proclaimed these days, you are the sons of the prophets and of the covenant that God made with your father, saying to Abraham, and in your offspring shall all the families of the earth be blessed." God, having raised up his servant, sent him to you first to bless you by turning every one of you from your wickedness. May the Lord add his blessing at the hearing and the reading of his word this morning. A few weeks ago, I mentioned to you a dear friend of mine who came from a Muslim background, and uh, he and his wife were attending our church at one point. And of course, he only showed up for Christmas and Easter time, but his wife got saved and her life was so transformed that he came to my office and knocked on my door and he said, Pastor Brad, could you, uh, could you tell me what I need to do to become a Christian? And so I sat down with my friend and started working through the gospel with him, sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ with him. And as time went on, my friend put his faith and trust in Jesus, and he came to Christ, and I started discipling him. My friend was, even though he was a new believer, something happened in his world that kind of changed everything. I received a phone call and heard that he had been put in the hospital. Something had gone terribly wrong. And it sounded like he didn't have very long to live. For some reason, all of his organs on the left side of his body were atrophying and shutting down. The doctors had no idea what was wrong with him or what to do for him. 
I couldn't believe it. He was this strong, vibrant man who had just given his life to Christ and now so quickly he was fading away and it was soon going to be all over. All of us have experienced difficult times, just like my friend, the new believer. Some even right now are going through the gauntlet, but the fact remains that all of us have faced times of uncertainty abandonment, betrayal, loneliness, loss, grief, illness, physical impairment, humiliation, and or a deep abiding pain. We've all been there, haven't we? So how do we make it through these times? How can we somehow bear all that we are experiencing? Well, as we'll see today in our text, the answer is faith. Faith in God Throughout God's word, we are told that it is only by faith that we can endure, faithfully waiting on him, faithfully asking him, faithfully submitting to him, and faithfully anticipating all that he can do. It is only by faith that we can find the restoration that we are longing for. And he shows us the compassion that we need as he raises us up in his time, as our weakness is made strong. He's the one who will transform our lives. He's the one who gives us a story to tell and a song to sing. It is faith in the name of Jesus that makes all the difference. He is our mighty God. He is the suffering servant, the holy and righteous one. He is the author of life. He is the great physician. He is the Messiah, the great prophet who fulfills all prophecy. He is the ultimate promised seed of Israel. No matter what you are going through, no matter what we are all going through, what we need more than anything else is faith in the name of Jesus, a faith that transforms our lives. Our message series has spread the word throughout the book of Acts. Today, we're looking at the faith that transforms In our passage this morning, we will see how a man is healed before a great number of people and how God uses this man for an opportunity to proclaim the gospel. A few weeks ago, we studied Peter's first sermon where we saw within his message outline the motifs of reprove, rebuke, exhort, evangelize that Paul taught in 2 Timothy 4.2. But in this passage, Peter uses the exact same outline again to share the gospel. We have three major truths to unpack today, but before we study, let's ask God's help. Would you please pray with me? Our gracious Heavenly Father, as we approach your word, we desperately need your help to unpack this passage, this sermon message that Peter proclaims, to understand the nature of the healing that this man experienced. So Lord, we ask that you would be our teacher, that you would be our guide. Lead us, change us, mold us, make us, conform us to your image, we ask, by the power of your spirit through hearing your word. We pray all this in your son's wonderful and awesome name this morning. Amen. Hopefully you have your sermon notes outlined from the materials you received. If you're watching online, we encourage you to Uh, print that out from the website so you can follow along in our study. But here's the first truth of three we're going to see today. By faith, we can endure. By faith, we can endure, first of all, as we faithfully wait. Notice what it says in verse one. Now, Peter and John were going up to the temple at the hour of prayer, the ninth hour. It's around noon. And a man lame from birth was being carried whom they laid daily at the gate of the temple, that is called the beautiful gate, to ask alms of those entering the temple. Imagine this lame man. Imagine what this man's life would would have been like every day, whether it was hot or cold. And someone loved him enough to carry him to the gate, which is beautiful in itself. It's called the beautiful gate, but how beautiful was it? Someone was obviously carrying this guy to be there outside the gate only to sit there all day and wait for someone to come by so that you might hear a clink in your cup. He couldn't have just, he could have just given up, right? He could have just said, well, why, why keep trying? But this cripple was faithful as he came every day and he faithfully waited. And here we see that it's always good to be in the right place at the right time and 
And here comes Peter and John. James, the brother of Jesus, says it this way, Count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds, for you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness, and let steadfastness have its full effect, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. When we face trials, this, this isn't our, our outlook, is it? This isn't how we see things. Count it all joy. You know, James, what's with you? What are you thinking? Count it all joy. Do you understand what I'm going through? Do you understand my difficulty, my problems? Count it all joy. But can we? Is it possible that somehow we might be able to count it all joy? Understanding that God is somehow throughout all the struggle, throughout all the difficulty, God is absolutely doing something incredible. For you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness and let steadfastness have its full effect that you may be perfect and complete. You mean I'm going to go through all this? And you're going to do something, God. You're going to perfect me. You're going to complete me where I will be lacking in nothing. You know, I've sat across a desk from many who wish their difficulties on anyone. But I've often said, you know, if this is the thing that brings you to that place where you need to be before God, and even though it's horrible what you're going through, I'm all for it for you because he's at work doing something amazing. What trial are you going through right now that you're waiting for God to bring deliverance? Beloved, by faith we can endure as we faithfully wait. Secondly, as we faithfully ask. Seeing Peter and John about to go into the temple, he asked to receive alms. He said, hey guys, do you have something for me? It's always good to ask. Worst case scenario is the answer is no or a flat out not yet. But as my dad says, ask and you shall receive. Don't ask and don't get squat, right? John 16, 24, Jesus said, ask and you will receive that your joy may be full. Matthew 7, Jesus says, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks, receives. Are you hearing that? This is what Jesus said. Everyone who asks, receives. And the one who seeks finds, and to the one who knocks, it will be open. What are you asking God for this morning? I encourage you, keep asking, keep seeking, keep knocking. You will receive, you will find. The door will open as we faithfully wait, as we faithfully ask. Thirdly, as we faithfully submit. Look at verse 4. Peter directed his gaze at him. So here's Peter now looking right at this guy, as did John. So now Peter and John are staring this guy down, and they said, look at us. What's the picture here? What do we see? This man obviously dejected, kind of an outcast in his society and community. And so here he is, cast down, holding his cup. Hey, hey, can you guys, can you guys kind kind of maybe taking a peek? Hey, can you guys help me out here? Why? He's full of humiliation. And these guys say, hey, take a look. Peter directs his gaze. Look at us, Peter says. Peter asks that he looks him in the face. And apparently in asking for alms, the man's face is turned down. Perhaps the man may have been reluctant in his submission, but nonetheless his face is downcast and he has an approach of submission and humility. We need to faithfully submit as this man is holding his cup and he's asking out of of humility. God often puts us in positions like this where there's nothing for us to do but to submit to the circumstance, submitting to our lot in life, trusting that behind the scenes he is yet at work even though things aren't going very well for us in the moment. He's doing his thing I know a woman right now, matter of fact, I was just talking to her yesterday. Her, her health is so tragic, so bad that there is nothing that she can do. There's nothing that the doctors can do for her to bring healing. All she can do is submit herself to the eventuality of her final demise. It's tragic, it's sad. For her, there is, however, a sense of relief in simply submitting to God in all that she's going through. You could hear it in the peacefulness and the tone of her voice. Yeah, there are tears, 
because things aren't going well. But she's like, I know God has this and I know I have nowhere else to turn but to trust him as we submit ourselves to him. And that's what my dear friend was saying yesterday as I was trying to encourage her. Beloved, God is not out to destroy us, but rather he's out to grow and mature us. Remember when the Israelites were wandering in the wilderness, God met them there in the wilderness experience. And Moses said, and you shall remember the whole way that the Lord your God has led you these 40 years in the wilderness, that he might humble you, testing you to know what was in your heart, whether you would keep his commandments or not. God is at work growing us, maturing us through all that we're enduring. By faith, we can endure as we faithfully wait, as we ask, as we submit ourselves to him. And fourth here, as we faithfully anticipate, verse five, and he, the lame man, looks up, fixes his attention on them, expecting to receive something from them. He doesn't know, he's holding his cup, you know, I'll get something out of these guys. They're asking me to look at them. And even with this situation, the crippled man remains hopeful. He has no idea that he's about to be healed. You have no idea in what way God is about to intervene in your world. But he yet believes that Peter and John are intent in giving him something. He faithfully anticipates what God will yet do. We too are waiting on God and faithfully anticipating what he will do with us in this life and in the life to come. Paul writes in Philippians 3.20, but our citizenship is in heaven and from it, we await a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. All of us, we're waiting. When will, when, will the, when will the Savior come? The Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly body to be like his glorious body by the power that enables him, even to, the, to subject all things to himself. I, therefore, my brothers whom I love and long for my joy and crown, stand firm thus in the Lord, my beloved. Can you stand firm as you faithfully anticipate what God is going to do, as you faithfully wait, as you submit, as you ask? Stand firm, dear ones. By faith, we can endure. Secondly, by faith, we are restored. It's by faith, it's through faith. As we remain faithful, we will most certainly be blessed through his loving kindness. Notice, first of all, the compassion that's shown. He will show us compassion. In verse 6, but Peter said, I have no silver and gold, but what I do have I give to you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. Now, at first glance, you might say, well, that's kind of a cruel thing to say to a cripple. Unless you're able to pull him up. And he stands. Peter and John, of course, could have easily walked on by and continued with their journey, but no. They are determined to find a way to love this man. They show him compassion. And God is also determined to show his love for you. Praise God for his gracious compassion toward us. And secondly, by faith we are restored in that he will raise us up. Notice in verse 7, and he took him by the right hand. Peter reaches down, grabs his right hand, and raised him up. Notice that we don't raise ourselves up. God does it. He may use others in our lives to bring it about, but God is the one who makes all the difference here. Perhaps you've heard it said, God helps those who help themselves. Totally unbiblical, by the way. How could this lame man possibly help himself? Can't. Only the work of God can make the difference here and the same is true in our own lives. Only God can raise us up out of the, our problems and our concerns, our worries. He will show us compassion. He will raise us up. Thirdly here, our weakness will be made strong. And notice what it says, and immediately in verse seven, his feet and ankles were made strong. How'd that happen? God did that. It's God who strengthens us by his sheer mercy and grace toward us. We have no ability to strengthen ourselves. Any strength that I have is from him and him alone. As he shows us compassion, as he raises us up, as he makes us strong, our lives will be transformed this man went from groveling and, and asking for help as a lame beggar 
In verse 8, we have a different man, a, a man with a transformed life. Look at verse 8. And leaping up, he stood and began to walk and entered the temple with him, walking and leaping and praising. Can you imagine this guy? He's, hey, hey, look at me. Hey, hey, hey. Do you, look what God just did. Because God did it. He, God does it all. And our lives are transformed. Has your life been transformed? What's changed? What do you have to run around and jump up and down about? <laughs> he transforms our lives. Again, this man has no ability to restore himself, right? This man has no ability to transform himself. This is completely a work of God. As he shows us compassion, as he raises us up, as he makes us strong, as he transforms us to such a degree that he gives us a story to tell. In verse 9, And all the people saw him walking and praising God and recognized him as the one who sat at the beautiful gate. Hey, isn't that that guy that was lame all these years? Asking for alms. And they were filled with wonder and amazement at what had happened to him. Is your life changed to such a degree that people are wondering, what's happened to you? Wherein you used to be this way, but now you're a different way in Christ. Remember my friend I started our message with. What got his attention was a transformed life in his wife. That's what brought him to my door saying, hey, what do I need to do to be a Christian? I've seen my wife so changed by the gospel of Jesus Christ. I want what she has. Are people looking into your world asking that question? Have you been transformed? Have you been changed? Do you have a story to tell in terms of who you used to be and now who you are? This is amazing. God is longing to bring himself glory in and through us because of all that he has done. It's all about him, not us. Lastly today, and this is going to go fast. You don't want to miss this. By faith, we endure. By faith, we are restored. Thirdly, by faith, we believe. By faith, we believe. Notice, first of all here, our God is the mighty God. He is mighty God. In verse 11, while he, that is the lame man, clung to Peter and John, all the people utterly astounded ran together to them in the portico called Solomon's. And when Peter saw it, he addressed the people. This is a, you know, a little opportunity. Hey, we got, a, we got a crowd. It's time for a message. Let's dish it out. Men of Israel, he cries out. Why do you wonder at this? Or why do you stare at us as though by our own power or piety we have made him walk? And by the way, notice this. It could have been, here's Peter and John going, hey, you know, we're pretty sharp people. Look what we did. No. This isn't about us. This is about God, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob, the God of our fathers. He, it's this God who glorified his servant Jesus. He is mighty God. He's the one who makes the difference. Now, remember Paul's sermon outline from 2 Timothy 4 with reprove, rebuke, exhort. Once again, Peter uses the same outline with his message to the crowd using the major themes of the biblical names of the Messiah. There are nine attributes here regarding the names of Christ. This is amazing where Peter can only use the Old Testament to preach his message to those who have gathered and are marveling over the healing of this lame man. Here we see reproof. He straightened them out. Hey, we didn't heal the man. God did that. That's reproof. Only God has that kind of power. He is mighty God. Isaiah 9, 6. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, and Prince of Peace. He is mighty God. Secondly, he is the suffering servant, this God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob, the God of our fathers, glorified his servant Jesus, 
whom you delivered over and denied in the presence of Pilate when he had decided to release him. And now we've moved from reproof to rebuke in the message. Whom you delivered over and denied in the presence of Pilate. Shame on you, you could hear him say. This Jesus, Yeshua, which literally means God is our salvation. This Jesus is the promised suffering servant From the likes of the great prophet Isaiah 53, he was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief, this suffering servant. And as one from whom men hide their face, hide their faces, he was despised and we esteemed him not. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten of God and afflicted. But he was pierced through for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. And with his wounds we are healed. He is mighty God. He is the promised suffering servant. Thirdly here, he is the holy and righteous one. Verse 14, the message continues. More rebuke here. But you denied the holy and righteous one, this Jesus. And you asked for a murder to be granted to you. You remember the call for Barabbas, right? Before Jesus goes to the cross. You wanted a murderer instead. What an incredibly strong rebuke. Shame on all of you, Peter is saying. You recall that Pilate had decided to release Jesus. Pilate didn't want to have anything to do with Jesus. Pilate could find nothing wrong with Jesus. He is the holy and righteous one. In Luke 23, 4, then Pilate said to the chief priests and the crowds, I find no guilt in this man. At least seven times throughout the gospel accounts, Pilate tried to get out of convicting Jesus. But our Jesus is the holy and righteous one. And fourthly, he's the author of life. As more rebuke comes from Peter with this message in verse 15, and you killed the author of life. You denied the holy and righteous one. You you took the, the servant Jesus you delivered over Denied in the presence of Pilate. Look what you've done. He's the author of life. John writes in John 1, 4, in him, that is in Jesus, was what? Life. And the life was the light of men. Jesus said to Martha, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. I am the resurrection and the life. He is the author of life. John writes in 1 John 5, 11, and this is the testimony that God gave us eternal life. And this life is in his son. Whoever has the son has life. Whoever does not have the son of God does not have life. Any questions here? It's not complicated, is it? He is mighty God, the suffering servant, the holy and righteous one, the author of life. And fifthly here, he is the great physician and his name by faith and his name has made this man strong in verse 16, whom you see and know and the faith that is through Jesus has given the man this perfect health in the presence of you all. Notice what it says. This man isn't just healed from being lame. He's been given perfect health now. Who knows what else he was suffering? Our Jesus, our Savior is the great physician. And by the way, this is the kind of verse that you, uh, you underline in your Bible or you put on a card and put it on your refrigerator. By faith in his name has made this man strong, whom you see and know. The man was given perfect health by faith in the name of Jesus. Jesus is the great physician. This won't be on the screen, but you recall back in Mark 2, as Jesus reclined at the table in his house, many tax collectors and sinners were reclining with Jesus and his disciples, for there were many who followed him. And the scribes of the Pharisees, when they saw that he was eating with sinners and tax collectors, said to the disciples, why does he eat it with tax collectors and sinners? And when Jesus heard it, he said to them, those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick... I came not to call the righteous, but sinners. He is the great physician. Not only are we all sick, we are all dead in our trespasses and sin. And he longs to heal us, to bring us back to life. 
life in his name. Jesus says, truly, truly, I say to you, whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life. He does not come into judgment, but has passed from death to life. Truly, truly, I say to you, an hour is coming and is now here when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God and those who hear will live. Beloved, we're not just sick with rebellion or sin. We are dead in our trespasses and we need life. We need the great physician to do a work. But not only is he the great physician, he is the Messiah, the promised one, the Christos, the Mashiach. In verse 17 of our passage, and now brothers, I know that you acted in ignorance. And notice the compassion change before his rebuke, rebuke, rebuke. And now, hey, wait a minute. I know you guys acted in ignorance, as did also your rulers. But what God foretold by the mouth of all the prophets that his Christ would suffer, he thus fulfilled. Repent, therefore, uh, what an exhortation here. Repent, therefore, and turn back that your sins may be blotted out, that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord, and that he may send the Christ appointed for you, Jesus. So Peter turns to loving and kind-hearted exhortation here. No longer is he rebuking. He's inviting them to repent. I know that you acted in ignorance, he says, Of course, Jesus from the cross said, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. This Christ, the Messiah. Peter spoke boldly of Jesus in Mark 8, 29. You are the Christ. Beloved, we need to repent. We need to turn away from the direction we've been going and we need to turn to faith in Christ. This is the the essence of the gospel. We need to turn back from the direction We've been going all along and now turn to faith in him, Jesus, whom heaven must receive, verse 21, until the time for restoring all the things about which God spoke by the mouth of his holy prophets long ago. Moses said, the Lord God will raise up for you a prophet like me from your brothers. You shall listen to him and whatever he tells you. And it shall be that every soul who does not listen to that prophet shall be destroyed from the people. In Deuteronomy 18, 15, we see the promise of a prophet that Moses lays out. And Jesus is precisely that prophet that was promised But not only that, he is the fulfillment of all prophecy. Verse 24, and all the prophets who have spoken from Samuel and those who came after him also proclaim these days. You remember Jesus on the road to Emmaus with the two men who had just come from Jerusalem after the resurrection. They had no idea who this Jesus was or where he'd gone. They thought it was over. He had died on the cross. Jesus says to them, them not knowing who he was. Oh, foolish ones and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Was it not necessary that the Christ should suffer these things and enter into his glory? And beginning with Moses, which is Genesis, you know, through all the way to Deuteronomy, the first five books of Moses, beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. And lastly, Not only is the fulfillment of all prophecy, he is the promised seed. Paul, or I should say Peter, concludes his message here. You are the sons of the prophets and the covenant that God made with your father, saying to Abraham, and in your offspring shall all the families of the earth be blessed. Offspring. Whenever you see the word offspring in the text, you could easily translate it as seed. And in your seed shall all the families of the earth be blessed. God, having raised up his servant, having raised up Jesus from the dead, sent him to you first to bless you by turning every one of you from your wickedness. Jesus is the promised offspring, the once and for all seed that was foretold at the very beginning. In Genesis 3.15, where God says to the serpent, I will put enmity between you and the woman, between your offspring and her offspring. Your seed and her seed. There will be a child who comes to destroy you. He shall bruise your head, it says, and you shall bruise his heel. In Galatians 3.16, now the promises were made to Abraham and to his offspring. It does not say into offsprings, referring to many, but referring to one. And to your offspring, to your seed, who is Christ. Remember, my friend, His eternal organs were all shutting down. 
It turned out that just a week before, my friend went into the hospital with major organ failure. He had been accidentally electrocuted by high voltage at work. The reality was that my friend should have died when he inadvertently electrocuted himself. But now the reality was that all the organs on the left side of his body had been fried and now his body was shutting down. It was going to be the end. But amazingly and miraculously, my friend was healed and is alive to this day. The only way the doctors could explain my friend's survival was that it was a miracle. The doctors were all perplexed. There's no way this guy should be alive. A few months after my friend's recovery, I had the privilege of baptizing him as he publicly proclaimed his faith in Christ. Not too long ago, he called to thank me for all I had done for him, but I reminded him that I really had done nothing. It was our mighty and faithful God who had healed him. It was God who had given him a new life and a restored marriage. God had done all of it. Beloved, faith is the answer. Faith in God. It is only by faith that we can endure. It is only by faith that we can find restoration. It is only by faith in the name of Jesus that makes any difference. He is our mighty God. He is the suffering servant, the holy and righteous one. He is the author of life, the great physician, the Messiah, the great prophet who fulfills all prophecy. He is the promised seed of Israel. He's that and a whole bunch more. No matter what we are going through, Jesus is the answer. And what we need more than anything else is faith in the name of Jesus. A faith that transforms our lives. Will you endure all that you're going through? Will you be restored? If you put your faith and trust in him, most certainly you will be. Have you placed your faith in his name? He is the only one who can make any difference. This Jesus who saves and who transforms. What do you need to do this morning with all this? I know some of your stories, many of you, I don't know the story. I don't know what you're going through right this moment, but he does. Maybe you find yourself, you're in a place where you're enduring right now. You're just trying to get by. Turn to him, trust him. He can handle it. Allow him to work in your world to transform you, to change you. Maybe you've been following Christ for a long time and everything's going pretty good. That's great. Well, good for you. Fantastic. But to what degree are you still growing and maturing in Christ as time goes on here? To such a degree that people look at your world and go, what happened to that guy? What happened to that gal? They're not the same. Are you living in such a way that people would notice, even remotely notice, that you follow Jesus? These are the challenges that we all have to deal with and get on board with. It's at his name that anything changes. The only reason I'm here to do anything is because of who he is and what he's done. It's all about him. Let's pray. Our gracious Heavenly Father, thank you so much for the power that's in your word, a power that transforms our lives. Lord, I thank you for the testimony of my friend and how you changed his life, at one point bringing him to the very brink of losing his life. And just as you raised the the lame man, I saw you with your, with your hand of grace and compassion. You raised my friend up. And you healed him. You gave him a new life. Lord, we're all longing for that. We're longing for a new life. And Lord, we know that that new life can only be found in you if we'll just submit ourselves to you as we wait, as we endure as we anticipate all that you can do because you are mighty God. You're the Messiah. You're the promised one. You're all that we've longed for. You're the one who can make all the difference. So Lord, have your way in us through the power of your name. 
because your name is indeed fantastic. It is a wonderful name. Lord, if there is someone here this morning who's wrestling with these things and needs to make a new commitment this morning, I pray they, they do that even right now in the quietness of this moment. They turn to you and say, Lord, I need you right now. I really need you, perhaps like never before. And Lord, I want you to have full permission to transform my life, transform me, change me into something beautiful. Lord, we thank you that you're so willing to do that. You're, you, uh, you just don't want to leave us. The, you love us so much, you don't want to leave us the way we were. <laughs> you want to change us to such a degree that we'd have a story to tell, jumping around, leaping for joy. You changed me. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for faith, this gift to us that changes everything. We pray all this in your son's wonderful and awesome name this morning. Amen. Amen. Well, I'd like to invite you to stand again. We're going to turn to hymn number 101, or you can uh, see the lyrics up on the screen here. His name is Wonderful. His name is wonderful. to think about this morning. Hope that you'll look at those notes and the scripture and think about that faith that transforms. Now let's look to the Lord in prayer in closing. Heavenly Father, we thank you for speaking to us today through your word and expressing our faith in song. May we express it in our everyday lives through this coming week. We realize that without faith, it's impossible to please you so may our lives be transformed by, by faith, and may we grow in our faith day by day. So dismiss us with your blessing and your peace. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. You dismiss.